Hello and welcome to the fifth in our food webinar series. I think it's worth tuning in today just to see the videos of the puppies. They'll be five weeks old tomorrow. That video was shot yesterday and the day before and they are really getting to be fun. And they make little chipmunk noises that are pretty funny. Okay, so for those of you who haven't been tuned in before, I'm Dr. Judy Morgan from Clayton Veterinary Associates in New Jersey. And we're talking about how to feed your pets uh, a healthy diet. So this is the fifth in our series of Food is the Foundation of Life. And today we are going to start talk about the energetics of your pets. Last week we talked about the energetics of the foods that we're feeding, uh, which foods are warming to the body, which foods are cooling to the body. Um, and so today we're going to talk about uh, how to determine whether your animal is too hot or too cold and what energetic food you should be feeding to your pet. And it's still true, you are what you eat. And we're still going to be talking about real foods, fresh fruits and veggies, fresh meats and whole grains. And again, you know, grass fed, whole grain, um, organic, locally sourced, products are, are still going to be your best bet. So when we talk about different formulations, we covered this a little last week, but each formulation, um, just because of what it is, will have certain energetics. So dry food is always going to be a little more warming to the body, no matter what the formulation, uh, you know, whether it's a fish based food or a lamb or chicken based food. But remember lamb and chicken are even going to be hotter in a dry formulation than a fish formulation in the dry food would be. Uh, raw foods are always going to be um, energetically uh, more cooling because they are not processed using high heat. Canned foods are somewhere in the middle. Your home cook that's uh, slow cooked in the slow cooker is, is going to be even cooler than that. So let's start talking about the energetics of pets. One of the first things that I look at with animals when they come in the office is their tongue color because um, from a Chinese medicine standpoint the tongue really tells us a lot about the body and the entire body is mapped out on the tongue. So I will look at the color of the tongue, the moisture level, and the texture. And um, once you start looking at tongues you'll discover that no two are alike. Um, and I, I found it intriguing when I first learned this. So uh, my recommendation is to get the people around you to stick out their tongues and all of you look, line up in front of a mirror and look at the differences in your tongues and you'll see that none of them are the same. And we can predict problems that are going to occur. We can tell problems that are going on now in the body. Uh, when I took my first acupuncture course and first learned about tongues, I was at a conference down in Florida and it was the day after the conference and we were hanging out around the pool for a day before heading home. And so I had everyone around me stick out their tongue and I stuck my mine out and said, what color is my tongue? And somebody said, oh my goodness, your tongue is bright yellow. And I you know, quick flipped through my pages and said, oh no, that means I'm sick. I have heat in my body. I don't feel sick. Well, let me just tell you, the next morning when we woke up to get on the plane, I had the flu so bad. I barely made it onto the plane. I was lying on the floor in the airport and all the stewardesses and the airline people were saying, oh, you can't get on the plane if you're that sick. So I would try to sit up. I did get on the plane, but I was really ill for a few days. So uh, if you look in the mirror and you see a bright yellow on your tongue, you are getting sick and you better start popping some vitamin C, some zinc, some something, because uh, that's the first indicator. So anyone with a fever or a pet with a fever will have a yellow coating or a yellow color in the center of the tongue. Um, we will also see yellow tongues if someone is jaundiced, um, meaning that we either have a red blood cell breakdown or we have a liver problem. So don't mistake those. Um, so let's just take a little peek at these guys in the picture. The one on the left, the Pomeranian looking thing, uh, the very tip of the tongue is bright red. And I love this picture because this dog is telling us a lot. The tip of the tongue signifies the heart. And this dog has a bright red kind of wet looking tip. But the rest of his tongue is a little paler and is 
fairly dry actually and has a huge crease down the center of that tongue. This is a dog who either has heart disease or is going to soon have heart disease. So I would be feeding this guy to try to get rid of some of that heart fire and I would be moisturizing and I would be feeding some hearts because we want to feed the organ that's having the problem. The guy all the way over on the right, he also has a fairly dry, fairly white tongue. Um, but again, the tip is redder than the rest, but that whole tongue is very pale if you compare that to the guy on the left. Um, and the guy on the right also has a little bit of a crease down the middle of his tongue. So we can tell a lot. So how do you know if your dog is hot or cold? Well, if your dog has a bright red tongue, he's got heat and there is a toxic heat that I see that is almost a brick red. It's a very, very dark brick red. And uh, a lot of times when I see those dogs with that brick red tongue, that's a sign that I've got a lymphoma or I've got something with a toxic heat that's brewing in that dog. And we want to try to cool off as quickly as possible. So when you look at the tongue, if it is a bright or dark red, you've got to go for some cooling foods because that's a dog who's pretty hot. If the tongue is very dry or cracked, then you need to get moisture into the diet. The cooling foods are going to tend to have more moisture. If you remember um, things that we talked about that were more cooling, um, duck, very high moisture. Um, celery and lettuce and some of the greens are going to be high moisture. So if you've got a dog with a very dry tongue, we want to get high moisture into them. So a guy with a brick red tongue, we're not going to feed lamb. We're not going to feed chicken. We might get away with beef because beef is fairly neutral, but we should be looking more toward duck or fish or rabbit, possibly pork, as um, our meat base in the food. So if you say, well, I can only feed dry food, which remember dry food is energetically very warming. If you can only feed dry food, then at least go for a base in that food that is going to be a rabbit or a duck, um, something that's, or a fish, something that's going to be more cooling. So if we have a tongue that's kind of pale, um, doesn't have a lot of color to it, um, or a very floppy tongue. Um, so that's something else I didn't really talk about. A tongue that just kind of is enlarged and kind of falls out of the mouth and drapes over the sides. That's a tongue that um, doesn't have a lot of energy and it might be found in a dog that doesn't have a lot of energy. So we want to maybe warm them up a little bit. Um, so, but the moisture tells you a lot and the color tells you a lot. So if you have a dog with that bright red tongue, you definitely want to feed cooling foods. Coat condition, that's going to tell us a lot about the moisture level in the body. So when you look at your dog's coat, you want it to be shiny. You want it to have multiple colors in the hair shafts. Um, even a black dog, if he's got a really, really shiny, healthy coat, you will see multiple sheens and colors under different light in that coat. Um, if it's a very dry, brittle coat, we don't have enough moisture in the body. And so probably we want to feed a canned food. We want to feed a raw food, something that's high moisture and possibly something that is a little more cooling. Um, for coats that are very, very dry and brittle or shedding a lot, we're probably uh, looking at a dog who's been too hot and has been too dried out. So we probably need to cool that dog. If you have a greasy wet coat, then perhaps you need to warm that guy up a little bit and maybe you don't want to feed that greasy wet dog a fish-based diet. Okay, your pet's coat color can give you clues. Dogs that are red, like Irish setters, tend or um, uh, chocolate labs which are really kind of a reddish color they tend to be either wood or fire personality which tends to be a more hot personality so they tend to um, need to be cooled down a little bit and might need more of the yin tonics or the cooling foods um, dogs that have a yellow coat like Lab yellow labradors um, they tend to be more of an earthy personality which is um, 
kind of the do -do 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 -do, I love you, everybody loves me, let's all get along. They tend to be a little bit slower and um, they like foods that are kind of neutral. Maybe you need to warm them up a little bit just to give them a little more energy. Dogs that are white, black, or gray tend to be uh, a little more cold, but it's not an across the board thing. And they might tolerate being warmed up a little bit more. Um, so these are not 100%. And so you might have an Irish setter who's very cold all the time and needs to be warmed up. But as a rule of thumb, I'm going to say that they tend to be more hot dogs and need to be cooled more. So color and dryness of the nose and the paw pads can tell you a lot about the internal temperature of the pet. So if we have a dry, brittle nose, um, I see this a lot in older dogs that have been fed dry food their entire life, particularly corn-based dry foods. Um, those guys tend to have a very dry, brittle nose. Um, and so they need some cooling foods. They need to be moisturized, they need to be cooled. On those same dogs that I see that dry, brittle nose, if I look at a foot pad, I'm probably going to see a gray, dry, um, maybe even a rough surface on the foot pads. So again, those guys usually need to be moisturized and cooled. Um, if you've got a, a really good black patent leather nose and a black patent leather foot, you're probably um, doing fairly well and you don't want to cool those guys too much because you're probably going to get them too cold. So they're going to be neutral. Maybe you need a little bit of warming for them. This uh, In this photo, the Doberman on the left, who just has a really nice shine to his coat, has what I would consider, at least looking at the picture from a distance, uh, probably a black patent leather nose. Um, and that's what we want to see. The Poodle on the right, he lost his black patent leather nose. And yes, he's a white dog, but I would bet that that dog used to have a black patent leather nose. So you need to look at what did their nose look like as a puppy? What did it look like before they were six months old? I think this guy had a black patent patent leather nose. If you look at his lower lip, it's black patent leather. His nose is not. He's lost the color. And so this guy has a bit of a chi deficiency, which means he's not, he's not getting all of his energy all the way out to all the points of his body. And so he probably needs a little bit of warming up. Um, I, I think that this guy is getting to be pretty deficient and I don't like that nose. That's not what I want to see. Um, so if you have puppy pictures of your dog, go back and look at those. And if you used to have a black nose and you don't have that black nose anymore, and we've got some dietary deficiencies that we need to take care of. So your pet's energy level can give you clues. This little guy on the left is a typical puppy. He's got a ton of energy and he could race across those fields all day long before he passes out. The young animals, just by nature, tend to be a lot hotter. They're what we consider young animals. So young is hot. And so they have tons of energy. They have heat in their body. And we need to cool them down a little bit. Um, you know, if I, if I take puppies and I put them on a lamb-based diet, they have behavior problems and more energy than they know what to do with and they just kind of can't control themselves they're like little adhd kids so if i put them on something neutral to a little bit cooling then they tend to be a lot better i've taken a lot of puppies and just switched them off a chicken based food onto a beef based food and sometimes that's enough by itself um, just to tone them down a little bit now, if we look at the two on the right in this picture, these guys are complete couch potatoes. That little, he looks like a Jack Russell, which is funny because Jack Russells are usually very hyper. Um, but this guy's probably a little bit older and has a little more girth around the middle and is very slow. So this guy probably is, tends to be a little more toward the cold side because he's just a couch potato and is starting to pack on some pounds. So we need to rev this guy up a little bit. Um, the kitty, who knows, kitty sleep 23 hours a day anyway. Um, but the little guy on the, the dog on the right there probably needs some foods to warm him up a little bit. Maybe we don't have to go all the way to lamb, but he might do very well on a chicken based diet because he could, he could use a little energy. 
So the breed can give you clues. There are certain breeds that are very hot and hyper. So I, I like to use Jack Russell Terriers as, um, <laughs> terrorists as we call them, um, as, as my example, because they are usually very young animals and they are usually hyper and tend to be warm. Irish setters tend to be very warm. Labradors cover the spectrum because they come in three different colors. The chocolates tend to be more warm, the um, yellows tend to be more neutral, and the uh, blacks tend to be cold. So, um, you know, beagles, they kind of come in two flavors, but for the most part, beagles are pretty slow. Um, you know, when they're used as hunting dogs, they're pretty hyper and active and out there, but most of the ones I see as house pets, tend to be a little more cold and they tend to want to lay around and not have a ton of energy. So, um, you know, most of the terrier breeds, they're pretty energetic and happy and hyper. Um, dachshunds, I find them for the most part to be, yay, 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 yay. You know, they've got lots and lots of energy. So we probably don't want to feed lamb to most of our dachshunds. It's going to burn them out. So you want to look at the breed of your dog and, and combine that with the color if your breed comes in multiple colors um, and kind of see where you are from there. I, I have Cavalier King Charles Spaniels, my red guy. My ruby is definitely a hot guy. He wants to be in charge. He is all over telling everybody what to do. Um, my little Blenheim, which is a uh, red and white, she's really laid back and not so energetic and she needs a little something to rev her up a little bit. So they kind of cover, um, you know, a lot of different bases. We tend to feed a variety of things in our house just to kind of keep everybody in check. Okay, your pet's breed in relation to the climate where you live can give you clues. So if you have a Husky or an Alaskan Malamute and you live in Florida, I can tell you your dog is not made to live in that climate and you better be cooling that dog down. That dog is used to living in very cold climates and if we think about what they eat in um, Alaska, they eat a lot of fish and so that dog is used to eating a lot of fish um, if we took a husky or a malamute and put them in florida and put them on a lamb and rice kibble we will burn them out so fast they'll be so hot and dry they just won't be able to stand themselves um, so you have to think about the breed that you have in relation to the climate that you live in um, if you took a um, Chinese crested, those guys have no hair, or a Mexican hairless, and you want to live in Canada with those guys, you either need to keep them inside under a pile of blankets, or you're probably going to have to feed them something warming for them to just keep up, because they don't have any insulation. They're used to living somewhere where it's very, very hot. So you need to um, consider that as well. Your pet's level of thirst can give you clues. And um, this is one of the big things that I see a lot. I've got these dogs that their presenting complaint is, boy, he is drinking buckets of water. Oh gee, and by the way, he's also panting a lot. So that tells us right there, this dog is hot, this dog is dry, this dog needs moisturizing, this dog needs to be cooled off. Um, if you have a dog who drinks very, very little, then He's doing just fine with his diet. You've got plenty of moisture in the diet. And I get people who call me after a diet change, you know, they go from a dry food to a home cooked or to a canned or to a frozen raw. And they say, my dog is not drinking any water. How do I get him to drink more? And the answer is you may not need to get him to drink more. He may be drinking plenty just in his diet. Um, and particularly with our guys now, we've started adding hot water to their frozen uh, food when it comes out of the refrigerator because we want to bring it up to war uh, to room temperature they're getting so much moisture in their diet i never see anyone at the water bowl except for my two oldest dogs who um you know are getting a little bit yin deficient or moisture deficient in their old age um, and one of them happens to be the ruby guy who is a little hot anyway so if you notice that the water bowl is going down more rapidly or you see your dog at the bowl a lot um, then that guy needs to be cooled off. And this is particularly true for cats. If you see your cat at the water bowl, your cat is too hot and dry. It is rare to see cats drink. They are not made to drink a lot of water. They drink very seldom. They are made to have a high moisture diet. So cats that are drinking are trying to catch up. I see our cats drink mm, once or twice a week, maybe. Um, I really never see them at the water bowl. 
Okay, your pet's choice of where to sleep can give you some clues. If you have the dog who is always looking for the cold tile floor, he wants to go in the bathroom and sleep on the cold tile floor. He goes down in the basement, he's laying on the kitchen tile floor, and he's all stretched out trying to get as much body surface in contact with that cold floor as possible. That's a dog that's too hot. That's a dog who is begging for you to give them something cooling to eat. They want watermelon. Um, on the other hand, if your dog is sleeping all curled up in a little ball and they're trying to snuggle, you know, in the dog bed, um, you know, close to the heat vent, that's a dog who's too cold and could really benefit from some warming foods like some chicken or possibly some lamb. So where they're going to sleep, if you have the dog who follows the sunspot around the house, oh, look, I'm, I'm on the carpet over here and here's the sun and, oh, it's so warm. You know, you take a pile of blankets out of the dryer and it's all warm and your dog goes over and snuggles down in there. That's a dog who's too cold and needs to be warmed up. So that can tell you a lot. Um, your pet's desire to snuggle or sleep alone can give you clues. So uh, when we go to bed at night, we sleep with six spaniels and invariably there will be one or two who try to get as close as they can. I mean, they're trying to get under the covers. They're trying to get right up next to my chest to get my body heat. And then I've got others who are down at the foot of the bed, lying under the fan, panting for all they're worth. So if your animal wants to get up and snuggle, yes, it's because they love you but if they're cold they will stay there all night if they're too hot they might come up and snuggle for a minute and then they're going to move away because they can't take the heat so you know if they want to snuggle all the time they're cold they'd like a little warming if they want to sleep at the foot of the bed or they get off the bed to go get on the bathroom tile floor they're too hot and you need to feed them some cooling foods so your pet's desire to play outside in different seasons can give you clues. I've got one little one who on a 90 degree day will go lay outside on the chaise lounge and soak up the sun. She wants to get warm. I've got others who as soon as it starts to snow and it's 30 degrees outside, they're out there for hours because all they want to do is cool off and play in the snow. So again, if you've got those huskies who are, you know, living here even in New Jersey they're miserable in the summer but they are so happy when it's snowing outside so depending on the climate your dog can give you a lot of clues whether they're hot or cold by whether or not they're willing to be outside a dog who's too hot in the 90 degree heat that we've been having is going to run outside do his business under the shade tree come right back in and lay on the air conditioning vent that's a guy who needs to be cooled off if he's going out and laying on the deck in the 90 degree weather that's a dog who would do fine with some warming foods because he's saying he needs more heat. So that'll give you um, a lot of information. Okay, level of panting. Here's our little guy with the red tongue again. So if your dog is panting, panting, panting all the time, just can't stop panting, um, there's a lot of heat in the body. And one of uh, the symptoms that we see with a lot of diseases that are associated with heat in the body for instance diabetes and Cushing's disease a lot of the endocrine diseases are associated with drinking a lot of water and panting a lot so those guys are hot they're trying to cool off the only way they know how so we can help them by feeding them cooling foods if we're feeding warming foods to those guys we're just adding fuel to the fire and they just can't get away from it so they do everything that they can if they're panting they're drinking a lot they're trying to lay on the cold floors they don't want to sleep in your bed those guys really 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 need to get cooled off our cocker spaniel she goes and sits in the pool all the time i think she's hot um, she gets tons and tons of cooling foods but she's an older dog and and um, you know she's just really trying to cool off all the time and the age can give you clues. So like we talked about before, puppies tend to be young. They have a lot of energy. And um, so they will usually um, do a little bit better with neutral to cooling foods. Whereas a lot of the old guys are slowing down. They're a little cold, you know, they're a little overweight. And so maybe they need a little bit of warming. But you have to be very careful because 
I see a lot of old dogs who have been on dry processed dog food their entire life, sometimes a lamb or chicken based, usually a chicken based, which is, you know, a dry food is heat processed and warming and drying. Chicken is hot energetically, warming and drying. So we take a dog and we put him on that his entire life, even though he's 14 years old, he might be a hot dog because he's been fed something warm and dry his entire life. And so now he's drinking a lot, peeing a lot. He's got a dry, cracked, crusty, gray nose, dry, cracked, crusty foot pads. So those guys need moisturizing and cooling, even though they're old. Um, but I also see a lot of older dogs who are going into kidney failure. They're really slowing down. They don't have much energy um, and they need to be warmed up a little bit. So your choice, the, your pet's choice of foods can also give you a clue. Um, years ago, ago, when I first started getting into this sort of thing, um, I had two Dobermans and a Rottweiler at the time. That was before I got into small dogs. And um, I decided to have a fun experiment. So I sent the dogs outside and then I spread out across the kitchen floor slices of watermelon and cantaloupe and a steak and some chicken and some rice. I mean, I just took I had, uh, some lettuce. I, I took all, I just gone to the grocery store and I thought, well, I'm going to try this little experiment. So I took all these different kinds of foods with all different energetics and I put them all over the floor. Now it's a Rottweiler and two Dobermans. So you're all sitting there going, well, that's a dumb thing to do because of course they're all going to go eat the steak or the chicken. That's what dogs do. Let me tell you, they came in, the Rottweiler who was a very hot dog, ran straight for the watermelon, bypassed the meat. He did not care. He went for the watermelon. Once that dog snarfed that watermelon, from that day on, I couldn't keep that dog away from watermelon. If there was one on the cabinet, he was on the cabinet. That dog loved watermelon. Meanwhile, my big, fat, slow, cold Doberman said, I'll take the chicken. Thank you very much. Um, so it was a really interesting little experiment. And sometimes your dogs will tell you, you know, yeah, I'm not that, that happy with that. And, and sometimes when people come in and go, well, my dog doesn't eat his food very well. You know, he kind of picks at it all day. Well, maybe it's the wrong food. Uh, maybe the energetics are wrong. So it's a fun little experiment. If you feel like playing, making a mess of your kitchen, <laughs> feel free to do so. Um, I just thought it was really interesting because I, you know, I personally said, oh, they're all going to go for the steak and we're going to have a big fight. And they didn't. So here's the key um, to feeding your pets energetically. The key is finding balance. Even if your pet's too hot or too cold, you have to balance the diet. You have to have some warming, some neutral, and some cooling foods. Too much of any one thing is not good. Um, I think I mentioned last week I had a client who decided her dog was hot. And so for the past few years, she has only fed yin foods and um and i am talking really cold foods that she was feeding this dog and the poor dog is so drained and so deficient so now we're trying to build back up so you don't want to go too far one way or the other if you have a dog that's a little on the cool side and you decide you're going to warm them up and you go with only lamb and white rice and you know all things that are really warming oats um, you will end up cooking that dog as well so you want to find some balance in there and um, someone asked last week if we could rotate proteins and yes absolutely because i don't want to see the pet get too hot or too cold um, at our house we uh, rotate between beef surf and turf which is a fish and beef um duck duck goose which is poultry and once in a while i throw in chicken now the chicken is very warming the surf and turf has got some cold fish and some kind of neutral beef uh, the beef is fairly neutral and the duck duck goose is a mix of different poultry so it's going to be a little cool to neutral um as well and then you know sometimes i throw in sardines okay they're going to be cold but then i throw in pumpkin and that's a little warm um, so there's always we're always striving to find balance um, so be really careful that you don't say oh i have a hot dog so i have to feed them all cold foods or i have a cold dog and i have to feed them all hot foods you need to find balance in what you're feeding so what's next um we're going to have 
three weeks off. I know last week I said it was two, but I have the opportunity to take a long weekend at the shore because someone said they would work for me and I'm going to take that opportunity. Um, so we're going to talk about blood and chi tonics and what foods are blood or chi tonics, chi is energy, and who needs blood and chi tonics. Um, I don't know whether that will end up being all in one webinar or maybe it will take us two to get through that, um, but that's what we're planning on covering next. So that will be four weeks from now. Um, so there's a three week break. I know I said two, but it's going to be three. Um, and we're ready for questions. First question before we see the puppies. How often do you suggest rotating proteins weekly, monthly, etc.? All right, how often do I suggest rotating proteins weekly, monthly, etc.? Um, <laughs> at our house, it tends to be about every three days because that's how fast we go through a tube of Stella and Chewy's frozen food because we have a lot of guys. Um, you don't have to do it that often. If you're crock potting or home cooking, each time you make a batch, I would probably rotate the protein um, or rotate the vegetables, rotate something in there. Um, you know, you can rotate your grain source. So if you're doing brown rice this week, maybe next week's batch has quinoa or the week after has barley. Um, so, you know, there's really no secret to it. If you're feeding a dry food, I might change up my proteins a little bit. Um, every bag or every other bag and remember you're not keeping a bag more often that or you know that's going to last more than three weeks oh we have children uh, now i said last week i wouldn't be able to hold them in my hands but we'll see there's who are you that's stripe say hi oh and snip is a fatso there they are say hi kids oh you're much more fun when you're running around playing now and they really have gotten so much more active and they squeak and they piddle and they poo <laughs> and they're going to be five weeks old tomorrow hey guys that's a good kid see ya they're a handful <laughs> okay if you have both a hot and a cold dog should i feed neutral Okay, so if you have a hot and a cold dog, should I feed neutral? So I'm assuming this is somebody who has one hot dog and one cold dog. Yes, I would feed a balanced diet. I would um, probably, yeah. I, I find that hot dogs tend to be more hot than cold dogs tend to be cold. And it's pretty hard to feed a really cold diet. So I would go cool to neutral on that. So beef or fish, I would probably rotate in there. I might throw a little, kind of like we do with our guys, I might throw a little chicken in there once in a while because we've got some hot and some cold. Um, although our guys have, over the years, have balanced out a lot. Um, so with one hot and one cold, I would never do lamb. Uh, because your hot guy is going to get way too hot. Your cold dog doesn't want to be on an all fish diet, but could probably do a surf and turf, could do a um, a beef, certainly. And beef is a chi tonic. All meat is basically a chi tonic. So um, you could get away with neutral. And then with your fruits and veggies and grains, I would kind of rotate them around a little bit too. Um, I probably wouldn't do white rice at all because again, that's going to be the most warming. Okay. Is Pam okay to use um, when cooking soft boiled scrambled eggs? Olive oil has given them diarrhea in the past. Can Pam, spray Pam, be used at, uh, for cooking soft boiled eggs, soft boiled, soft scrambled, whatever, yeah. um, for the pan because olive oil has given them diarrhea? Uh, Pam is actually canola oil in a spray. So you can either cook with canola oil or you could use a little bit of that. You could use um, a real small touch of butter. Um, but if the olive oil has given them diarrhea, um, I don't have a big problem with using Pam, or you could just get canola oil. Okay, uh, and do you know of any good websites or listings to find a list of foods and their hot or cold equivalent? A good website to list hot or cold equivalents for foods. There's some really good books out there with it. Um, you can go back to was it the last webinar? Webinar four, yes, webinar four, we had um, charts there. Um, so you can go back if you weren't um, 
on that one and um, freeze frame and write all of those down. Um, I have a really, really good chart at my office that I got from the Qi Institute of uh, Veterinary Chinese Medicine. Um, and they are in Florida and you might be able to buy their chart. Um, they're in Gainesville, Florida. It's the Chi Institute. They have a really, really nice wall chart, which I happen to have in my office. Um, there are a couple of good books out there. One of which is called the Tao, T-A-O of healthy eating by Bob Flaws, F-L-A-W-S. Um, it's available on Amazon. And he also has a second book. Uh, it's a human book, but it, it converts. Um, he has a second book with recipes, you know, whether you need uh, chi tonics, blood tonics, warming foods, cooling foods. Um, I'm not sure if he has the, the lists of hot and cold in there, but I'm going to bet he probably does. Um, so those, those would be good sources. And um, I also have a couple of lists at my office. You can email me and I might get smart enough to email them back to you. <laughs> That's it. Okay. All right. So, yay, we were a little short this week. Um, so if you have any questions, you uh, can email them to me or send me Facebook messages and I will try to get them answered. Um, you know, this, I think this is kind of one of the fun parts of uh, figuring out, um, you know, the health of animals and uh, try it with your friends. It's a fun party game. Hey, everybody stick out your tongue and let's look at everybody's tongue. Um, and you know, maybe I'm weird. I, it's a fun party game for me only. Um, but you will soon discover that there's a huge variety. It's kind of like fingerprints. No two are the same. So thank you very much for tuning in and uh, I will see you back here in four weeks. Thank you for joining us for our food webinar. Remember to follow us on all of our social media on Facebook and Twitter at Clayton Vet NJ. That's Clayton Vet NJ. Remember to visit our website as well for more information about how you can help your pet live a healthier lifestyle. Make sure you join us next week for the next installment of Dr. Morgan's Food Webinars.